So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Felicia Waldman, uh, Associate Professor at the University of Bucharest, uh, Deputy Head of the Romanian Delegation to the IRA, and member of several committees of the IRA. Uh, my chairing this particular panel relates to my interest in um, Holocaust education and the process of memorialization. And because we are in a university, and uh, I'm an academic, I shall open the session with a quotation. As uh, Eyal Zandberg shows in one of his articles, since the 1990s, there has been a growing interest in researching Holocaust representations through the various genres of the popular media. This has been sparked by a number of works of popular culture that have roused considerable intellectual but also public discourse, such as Art Spiegelman's comic work Mouse. But the leading cultural event that brought the question of Holocaust representation in popular culture to the forefront was, as we all know, uh, Steven Spielberg's already mentioned film Schindler's List, followed shortly by Roberto Benigni's 1998 film Life is Beautiful. After these two films, uh, public discourse was much more open to recognizing the central role that popular artifacts play in the shaping of collective memory. The fact is that since the Holocaust became part of popular culture, popular media have supplied us with an arrangement of a certain iconic symbolism in depicting the Holocaust, including a range of stereotypes that uh, formed our imagination of the genocide and our memory of it. In these circumstances, it is worth recalling Israeli historian Anita Shapira's discussion about the paradox that although more archives are being opened and more information about the Holocaust is in the hands of the historians, they, the historians, have less power to shape the past. Cinema and television are today considered more authoritative uh, tellers of the past and shapers of public memory. And that is why we have invited uh, our speakers today Evelyn Gantz, uh, Andras Kovac, and Christina Finch to speak about this sensitive topic. We shall start with Evelyn, who is holding the chair of modern Jewish history at the University of Amsterdam. As a researcher, she is affiliated at the Netherlands Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies. She wrote about modern Jewish ideologies, changing Jewish identities, and Jewish family history. And for today, it is especially relevant that she publishes regularly on anti-Jewish stereotypes and historical and contemporary anti-Semitism. She led the research project, The Dynamics of Contemporary Anti-Semitism in a Globalizing Context, and is finishing with co-editor Rem Koensel, the volume Blaming the Jew, Histories of Anti-Semitism in Post-War Dutch Society. Please. Thank you. Um, my contribution is about Shoah, distortion and trivialization and remembrance and commemorations and especially anti-Semitism mainly in the Netherlands. Social media are part of a broader story. Well, um, my first statement is that and the Holocaust and the founding and existence of Israel, which both had by far the greatest impact on 20th century Jewish history, have turned against the Jews. This started directly after the end of the German occupation. In 1945, the abuse, they have forgotten to gas you, came into use, during rows with Jews in all kinds of situations. A former resistance fighter was brought to court because he had written in 1947 that the Jews had not defended themselves enough against the Nazis, but only came into action when their property was threatened. Stereotypes are the backbone of anti-Semitism and racism. I just named two of them. An old one, the passive, cowardly Jew, and a new, post-Holocaust one. The Jew is there to be gassed. Both of them can be connected to what in Germany has been coined as Schuldabwehr antisemitismus, antisemitism based on defense of guilt. In the Netherlands, 75% of the Jews has been murdered, more than anywhere else in occupied Western Europe. 
I should emphasize right away that the main reasons for this were the all-embracing power and strong anti-Semitic ideology of the occupying SS regime. But up till now, there is a public and academic debate going on about the attitude of the non-Jewish population towards the persecuted Jews. In 1947, also during the journey, both a very serious undertaking and a media stunt of the famous Exodus ship full of Jewish immigrants for Palestine, a Dutch Protestant weekly wrote that the Jews behaved like Goebbels. Gradually, and certainly since the Six-Day War of 1967, which made Israel into an occupying force, it would be more common to compare or even equate Israeli, Zionist, or Jews, often these three categories being mixed up with Nazis. Secondly, I see anti-Semitism as a multifunctional projection screen, a projection of one's own frustrations, resentments, or forbidden longings on the Jew. Since Christianity, it has been tempting to assign disproportionate guilt to the Jews for all sorts of catastrophes and unwanted developments, based on an enormous and diverging range of stereotypes which cling to each other, from the Christ and Christian killer to Judas, from the rich materialistic to the perverse Jew, from the powerful to the chicken-hearted nervous Jew, this last pair of stereotypes shows most clearly the Janus face of the Jew, both powerful and afraid. Thirdly, there are two contrasting tendencies in the Netherlands with respect to Holocaust remembrance and commemoration. Since the end 60s and the 70s, the Shoah has moved slowly to a central position in public memory and historiography in the context of World War II. There has been a lot of attention for and respect towards Jewish survivors, their specific life stories, and of historical research on diverse aspects of the Shoah. At the same time, from the 80s up till now, dissenting voices arose against this supposed dominant position. Precisely because criticizing Jews was considered to be a taboo, controversial jokes arose about the gas chamber on the pretext of freedom of speech. Freedom of speech mentioned before. In the domain of football, anti-Semitic slogans are directed against Ajax, the Amsterdam football club which has a Jewish image. During matches, on banners, and on the website of rival clubs, here do the social media enter, Ajax players and their supporters are yelled at, we go on Jew hunt, and Hamas, Hamas, all Jews to the gas. Fourthly, except for the lust to provoke and the impact of old and new stereotypes, 1982, the year of the massacres in the Lebanon refugee camps, Sabra and Shatila, had its impact too. The same goes for the two intifadas, for Israel's occupation policies, and for its military invasions as a reaction on bomb and rocket attacks from Lebanon and Gaza. Solidarity and identification with the Palestinians increased. At the end of 2008, Israel launched Operation Cast Lead against Gaza, which attracted international criticism being seen as a disproportionate reaction. The Dutch-based Center for Information and Documentation on Israel, CD, which, although independent, cites solidarity with Israel as its key principle, was sent the following anti-Semitic hate mail, and I quote, Hitler was a nice man compared to the Jews in Israel. Gaze all those pigs and then feed them to the dogs, end of quote. A very recent research by order of the Dutch government on the attitude of Muslim youngsters to respectively Jews 
and Zionists shows that mostly these youngsters do not so much feel aggressively towards Jews, but towards what they see as Zionists, whom they identify with Jews and Israelis, who support the occupation of West Bank and Gaza and the idea of a greater Israel. In their view of Zionists, however, old and new anti-Jewish -Jew stereotypes rather often are integrated. Like Zionists dominating the press, being child killers, immoral, conspiring for world power, and last but not least, being perpetrators, Nazis, aiming at genocide. Fifthly, this mixing of the stereotypical Jew and Zionist does certainly not apply to Dutch Muslim citizens only. There was a turbulent public debate with regard to the Holocaust Memorial Day in the Netherlands in 2012. The National Committee had chosen, chosen a poem of a pupil about his great uncle, an SS soldier who was killed at the German Eastern Front to be read at the Central Square in Amsterdam, the Dam. He too was supposedly a victim of history of his own wrong choices. After a lot of protests, the poem was removed from the program. And it should be mentioned, though, that much later, this debate led to the political decision that on the Dutch Memorial Day, only victims and not possible former perpetrators would be remembered, but also those killed during later Dutch military missions. But there were also protests from the other side. The headlight and content of an article in a so-called respectable um, daily said, don't turn the commemoration of the dead into the commemoration of the Jews. And one of many reactions in the social media read, and I'm going to quote again, they, the Jews, are just like spoiled children. Only we should receive this intention. It makes me so tired. And for fun, have a look what is happening in Israel. End of quote. Six. After the proceeding, I present the following observation. The Jew as a victim arouses both compassion and Rejection, envy, has been named too. Paradoxically, the stereotype of the powerful Jew has actually been reinforced in the post-war period precisely by his role as victim. First of all, the Jew is resented for claiming to be the ultimate victim and accused of maintaining a monopoly in suffering. Secondly, Jewish victims are accused of using their professional status as victim as an instrument of power, of cashing in on it, in political, material, moral, and emotional ways. Thirdly, the Jew falls outside the apparent dichotomy of victim and perpetrator and arouses all the more animosity and hate because he is felt to pose as a victim while actually being a perpetrator in Israel and elsewhere. This, so to say, three-piece costume of the stereotypical Jew has given post-war anti-Semitism a powerful new dimension in the social media and elsewhere. I will finish now with two statements and questions perhaps relevant for the discussion. So, seven, could it be that after the worldwide shock and horror because of the bloody Islamist attack on the satirical Paris journal Hebdo in January 2015, there was relatively less attention for the anti-Semitic assault on the kosher supermarket preceded by those in Toulouse and Brussels and followed by that in Copenhagen 
because there is a connection here with the free piece costume of the stereotypical Jew, which I just mentioned, and especially the worldwide criticism on Israel's politics. And could one state, this is very hypothetical, that also Abdo itself is a representation of the Jew as a symbol of modernity, the Western world, degeneration and godlessness, satire. And then the Arab French police officer that was murdered. In the Netherlands, police officers are during confrontation, confrontations with all kinds of youngsters called Jew, looked upon as part or instrument of the establishment. And then finally eight, and I'm, I'm adding to Constantin Gebert. Apparently, the post-war stereotype of the Jew is transferable. The anti-Semitic jargon is so deeply internalized that it is on social media adopted in reactions on the masses of Syrian, Afghan, Eritrean, and other refugees nowadays. I restrict myself here to a row of reactions on Facebook on a statement of a Dutch social democrat who is in favor of the relief of these refugees. And I end with these quotations. It's about time that a second Hitler rises, who instead of the Jewish people deals with them, the refugees. No pity, just deal with them. Another voice, totally agree, gas them. Other comment, dirty cunt people in the ovens with them. And the gas chambers are still there. And then, finally, the direct link with anti-Semitism itself. Quote, yeah, what shall I say? Hitler actually was right, exterminating a people like that. And yes, indeed, Hitler was no darling, but he warned us all for this. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. We shall continue with uh, Andras Kovac, a sociologist, Doctor of Sciences at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Professor at the Central European University in Budapest with the Nationalism Studies Program, respectively the Jewish Studies Program. His previous appointments and research stays at uh, Paderborn University, Ecole des Hautes d'Anciens Sociales in Paris, NYU, the University of Vienne, uh, the Technical University in Berlin and many others uh, have made him an uh, important researcher in, this, uh, in such research topics as um, Jewish identity and anti-Semitism in post-war Hungary, memory and identity, socio-economic attitudes and political choice. Uh, he's the author of many articles on these topics and his latest book is The Stranger at Hand, Anti-Semitic Prejudices in Post-Communist Hungary, Brill Light and Boston, 2011. Andras, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I have to tell you that I was a bit surprised uh, uh, when I uh, looked at the subject which was assigned to me, speak about popular uh, media, uh, since I have never done any research on popular media, and I have to confess is that I am not a very frequent reader of uh, p popular media outlets. Uh, therefore, what I uh, we try to speak about is a sort of uh, case study focused uh, approach of the subject. I don't know how far is it generalizable, what I will tell here. Uh, the old friend of mine said to, uh, all the time that uh, if you want to have a uh, if you want correctly uh, uh, generalize, then you have to depart only from one single case. So perhaps this is here. Uh, uh, the case too. So, uh, popular media, Felicia had uh, said already, popular media, this concept is a very wide one, uh, and um, it's not really possible to uh, look into all segments uh, of uh, uh, popular media. What I have chosen here uh, is uh, uh, one branch of popular media, 
tabloids, uh, lifestyle magazines, commercial TV channels. And this is a very uh, uh, effective uh, form of popular media on one hand. On the other hand, we have to know that, uh, that uh, it has a declining audience, especially am among urban youth. So this is a very important change in uh, the last uh, uh, 10, uh, uh, 15 uh, years. Uh, what uh, can we tell about uh, the appearance of Holocaust in Hungarian uh, popular media? I uh, looked into uh, uh, the publications of uh, uh, two uh, dailies, uh, uh, tabloids, uh, uh, one was Blick and the other one was Metropol. These are two very uh, uh, widely distributed Hungarian uh, uh, dailies, uh, uh, tabloids with uh, 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 more than uh, 100,000 copies uh, a day, and I took two years uh, uh, for looking at. Uh, uh, firstly, I looked at uh, uh, the publications of the Blick in uh, 2015, and I found that only 20 pieces in the whole year mentioned uh, the Holocaust, plus there were 29 uh, uh, articles on the award-winning uh, uh, movie in Cannes, uh, The Soul of Shaw, A Son of Shaw, uh, but this is a separate uh, uh, issue. Out of these uh, 20 pieces, uh, uh, five were about um, anti-Semitism in general, lawsuits uh, against uh, deniers, Miklos spoke about them, uh, uh, and uh, three exclusively on the Roma Holocaust. Uh, in, 90, in, in the Metropole, this is the second tabloid, there were altogether 33 pieces mentioning the Holocaust, uh, plus 11 pieces on the movie on uh, uh, Charles' son. And out of this uh, uh, 23, six were exclusively on the Roma Holocaust, five on different memorial events, uh, 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 and another six on anti-Semitism, um, the denial of anti-Semitism, and the lawsuits connected to uh, uh, the trial. So this is somehow, uh, verifies what Costa Gebert has said before that uh, uh, the Holocaust quite frequently, relatively frequently in an inf infrequent uh, distribution uh, appears uh, without a Jewish uh, uh, context. Uh, and the, the picture is the, exactly the same when you look at the 2014 uh, 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 copies. Uh, this is uh, interesting because this was the 60 years of anniversary of the Hungarian Holocaust, uh, and there were only 14 pieces in the bleak on the Holocaust, three of them exclusively on the Roma Holocaust, and only two of them on the 60th anniversary. So this is more or less how uh, uh, the, uh, the tabloids are treating uh, uh, the subject. I would like to give one qualitative example, uh, 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 the, the example of March of uh, uh, the Living Budapest uh, 2013. You, uh, you might uh, know March of the Living is a very impressive event. 10,000 are marching on the streets of Budapest, renowned personalities of politics, culture, etc., participate uh, on the march. So in this year, 2013, a group of far-right people, uh, uh, activists, wanted to disrupt the event. Firstly, they planned a motorbike match with the slogan, Give Gas, but this was banned by the Ministry of Interior. Uh, but uh, the same people, or another branch of them, uh, hang a banner um, on, with anti Israeli anti-Semitically formulated slogans on the bridge on the route of the March of the, march of the Living. All media outlets reported on the issue. Uh, the huge majority of the reports appeared under the heading, the March of Living has been disrupted. Two examples of content, one is, was an, another tabloid, Bosch Online, reported in 12 lines about the uh, uh, event, and eight was about the conflict, and the most popular Hungarian internet 
magazine index reported in 31 lines about the conflict and 20 was about uh, 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 the conflict itself, so not about the event. So this again uh, reflects certain typical traits of popular media. What are these typical traits of popular media? Presenting the exemption, the co extreme, uh, uh, the conflict, something visually effective, uh, focusing on murder, genocide, torture, extreme personalities like, for example, the personality of Amon um, uh, Goethe in Schindler's List with uh, his sadistic traits uh, uh, or um, victims, etc., or displaying heartbreaking stories of survivors about paternal love, childhood traumata, how they preserve memory objects uh, in their homes, and in general, crime, uh, punishment, etc., etc. So this is, uh, this, uh, these are uh, the themes, uh, uh, or these are the perspectives, uh, popular uh, tabloid type of media looks at events, political and social events. And it is often said that all this means uh, 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 what, uh, and all this, uh, 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 all this means a sort of minimization of and relativization of uh, uh, the Holocaust. And yes, in a certain sense, uh, this is true. But in a certain sense, uh, uh, it has something parallel with that what Kostak uh, Gebert spoke about, the evacuation of Jewishness uh, uh, by transforming it into a sort of uh, universal suffering. Structurally, what happens here is the same, but not into the same direction. Uh, here, in the case of uh, tabloids, in the case of popular media, uh, the intent is to fulfill consumer needs and consumer demands for certain subjects, demands for certain subjects, as crime, celebrities, Hitler is a celebrity, sexuality, uh, etc., etc. And the Holocaust only serves as a context uh, for these issues. It only serves uh, as uh, the career of a calculated message about something else, and it is a very effective transporter of this message, because in this case, not only the message itself belongs to the extreme, but the thematic context, context of the message too. And this, uh, 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 the result, the outcome of this is that the impact of the message on something else than the Holocaust, but carried by an extreme uh, context, this, in this case, the, the impact of the message will be multiplied. And this is a serious problem, uh, a serious problem from a theoretical point of view. Uh, you might all have heard about the theory of normative pressure. Normative pre uh, pressure uh, theory suggests that uh, 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 the framing of uh, the presentation of certain issues have a normative function, this will determine how people, how the audience uh, will uh, think about the event, what kind of cognitive uh, frames will be used to classify, to evaluate uh, the event, or even to behave in a certain way towards uh, uh, the given uh, uh, event, how it will be handled uh, in other fields uh, too. And popular media is a very effective tool for setting normative frames. And therefore, it will have a very uh, uh, powerful effect on how people will think about the Holocaust. And this effect is not intended. So it's not an intended denial of the Holocaust, intended relativization of minimization. It is simply spontaneous. Uh, uh, a consequence uh, of certain given uh, rules. And I think this problem deserves further attention. Thank you. Thank you. I now invite our uh, next speaker, Christina Finch, who is currently uh, the head of the Tolerance and Non-Discrimination Department at ODIR. 
She is the former managing director for Identity and Discrimination Unit at Amnesty International and adjunct law professor at George Mason University School of Law. At Amnesty International, Mrs. Finch focused on women's and lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender human rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, and multilateral issues. Prior to joining the Amnesty International in October 2009, she served as senior counsel to the Human Rights Campaign, where she focused on the issues of bias-motivated violence. She has testified on legal and policy issues before the UN Human Rights Council, World Bank, and the US Congress, and is a featured expert on the women's media centers she source uh, in the US. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Waldman, for that kind introduction. And thank you very much to the IRA chair and to Mark Weitzman, the chair of the IRA Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial for this kind invitation. It's an honor for me to be here to address you alongside such distinguished panelists as Professor Gans and Professor Kovash. Having read the agenda, I think there are two points that could be added to the list of issues that we're discussing here today. They are first, most of the discussion has so far been based on the correct assumption that the Holocaust forms part of our public discourse. We are discussing different forms of use and abuse of the Holocaust in public discourse in countries where there's already a conversation about the Shoah. I think it's important to also take a step back and ask, looking at the headline of our panel, how popular culture and the media can help introduce this topic and create a discourse in the first place in countries that have yet to face this part of European history, this very dark chapter in the history of humankind. The question of how best to initiate a public conversation about the Holocaust is an important concern when it comes to the issue of geographical outreach, a topic that Ira, Odir, and other permanent international partners have discussed very intensively over the last couple of years. The 57 participating states of the OSCE have committed themselves to promoting Holocaust remembrance and education. As a survey that we and ODIR have updated this year makes clear, many, but far from all, governments promote Holocaust remembrance. A good indicator for whether or not there is public discourse about the Holocaust is whether or not the country in question has established a Holocaust Memorial Day. As our survey shows, 33 of the, OSC, of the 57 OSC participating states have established a Holocaust Memorial Day, and the Holocaust is taught in schools of some 25 of the 57 OSC participating states. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we engage countries and regions where the Holocaust so far has not been discussed in a conversation about the Shoah, and what lessons can we draw from it? We certainly know that our colleagues at the UN and at UNESCO have found very effective ways of introducing this topic to societies in different parts of the world by relating it to the very pertinent question of the prevention of genocide. Looping this question back to our panel, I would suggest that we need to discuss to what extent popular culture and media can be an ally in raising awareness of the Holocaust, in spreading and intensifying a public consciousness about the Shoah, both geographically but also within societies. When one of my colleagues recently visited an OSCE participating state with a very low level of public awareness about the Holocaust, a teacher approached her with the book, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Clearly, it was this book that had first introduced this teacher to the Holocaust, and if anything, she would probably recommend this book to her students, before the government of the country in question had reviewed and adjusted the curriculum so as to accurately address the Holocaust and provide resources and accounts that experts may consider to be more appropriate than this popular novel. Since movies and popular books about the Holocaust travel much faster than the outreach strategies conceived of by intergovernmental organizations, we have to, as this conference has rightly suggested, find ways of using the opportunities offered by freedom of expression to work towards accurate and meaningful popular representations of the Holocaust and perhaps find ways, and I know, Mark, this has come up in the work that your committee is doing, to advise and influence those producing popular contributions to our increasingly globalized discourse about the Holocaust. And when we conduct our outreach, 
I would argue we have to find ways of bringing an interest that may have been sparked by an internationally popular book like The Boy in the Striped Pajamas back to the very local, historical context that needs to be at the heart of society's reflection about the Holocaust for this reflection to be meaningful, in particular when it comes to countries where the Holocaust took place. In other words, we don't only need to be accurate, but we need many different locally and nationally relevant popular ways of raising awareness about the Holocaust. The second point I'd like to raise takes a different uh, angle on this topic. The main focus of our work in the Tolerance and Non-Discrimination Department at ODEER is cooperating with governments and civil society to develop effective responses to hate crime. The link between the popular and social use and misuse of the Holocaust and hate crime may not be evident at first sight, but when taking a closer look at how anti-Semitic hate crimes manifest themselves in the OSC region, one can argue, however, that some anti-Semitic crimes constitute a form of social abuse of the Holocaust. So let me elaborate on what I mean by that. Holocaust memorials, sites dedicated to the memory of the Holocaust, are targeted in vandal attacks motivated by anti-Semitism. We took a look at civil society reports before this conference, and it turns out that, that, we, re that we receive when we put together our hate crime reporting, and it turns out that such incidents have been reported from 17 OSCE participating states in the last four years. In fact, I encourage all of you to take a look at ODIR's hate crime reporting and ODIR's website on this issue, because today we're releasing a special story about attacks on Holocaust memorials. There's a second dimension. Unfortunately, the perpetrators of anti-Semitic hate crimes don't just target objects and inflict damage to property and places of worship or commemoration, horrific enough as that would be, they also target human beings. References to the Holocaust are a feature of many physical anti-Semitic attacks on Jewish people that have been reported to us. Slurs such as, go to Auschwitz, or Jews to the gas, or you deserve to burn, are expressed in the wake of some of the reported violent attacks and assaults on Jewish people. In these cases, the Holocaust is transformed into a point of reference that is meant to threaten and express hatred towards Jews. Far from denying the Holocaust, the perpetrators of these acts are fully aware of the meaning of the word and use it in an extremely harmful and terrifying way to intimidate and threaten Jewish people or people perceived to be Jewish and to intensify the fear they are inflicting on their victims through the attack. That, I would say, does indeed constitute a form of social abuse of the Holocaust in addition to a human rights violation. Such violent incidents do not take place in a vacuum. OSC participating states have recognized that hate crimes can be fueled by anti-Semitic propaganda, including on the internet. It can be challenging to establish and corroborate direct causal links, but I was struck by an example that a civil society expert shared at a recent ODIR event. He showed pictures of the desecration of a Jewish cemetery that took place in 2014 and explained that the slogans that were painted on the graves, including slogans such as, hollow lies, or the Holocaust did not happen, but it will, had featured prominently on anti-Semitic websites in the years preceding these attacks. So the second point I want to contribute to the discussion is really to stress that references to the Holocaust in the context of violence and or threatening anti-Semitic incidents are part of the spectrum of how Holocaust abuse manifests itself in contemporary societies in the OSC region. And that's why we need to work with and educate governments on how to best recognize anti-Semitic bias indicators and respond to these attacks. So I'd like to close by saying that as part of our work in the Tolerance and Non-Discrimination Department at ODIR, we're currently developing a practical guide that will draw attention to the need for law enforcement agencies to become aware of these very specific manifestations of anti-Semitism and to address them. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Uh, so I would first invite the speakers to uh, ask each other questions or make comments if they have to each other's presentation. Uh, if not, um, I will raise the question of uh, whether it is really possible to do something 
uh, very concrete. Uh, as Christina already mentioned, uh, there are steps to be taken in this regard. There are um, uh, strategies uh, to be thought of in terms of governments, but experts, we, especially in the IRA as experts, uh, since we were talking about um, cooperation and about uh, the need to be directly involved and uh, um, active actors in this regard, is it possible to do something? Um, is it possible to influence, is it really possible to influence popular media, popular culture, which is really out of control in a way? Uh, how is it that we can uh, work together with popular media? And in this regard, I'm going to do a little bit of advertisement <laughs> and say that uh, building on this conference, the Romanian chairmanship next year intends to organize a conference on social media precisely to take further this discussion and see what can be done. But for the moment, I would invite the speakers and uh, the uh, audience to come up with um, concrete suggestions or ideas on how this can be achieved, how this cooperation and partnership can be achieved. Can we really influence popular media? Um, well, well, I just like Andras Kovacs, I'm not specialized on, in social media. I'm, I'm trying to analyze anti-Semitism and Holocaust trivialization, and that's what I try to do. And social media are, just, are part of a broader story in which, um, as, 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 I, as I try to say, this free uh, peace costume, the Jew as, as a victim of the Holocaust, is uh, envied as the, and, and resented as claiming the, to be the ultimate victim, and secondly, um, uh, profiting from this, and thirdly, posing as a victim, but actually being a perpetrator. And I think these are motives which are very strong, uh, well, more subtly, like Juliane Wetzel said, uh, in the, in the so-called respectable um, uh, press, but less subtly and, and very explicit in, on the social uh, uh, media. And I, I, I think we should all not only talk, well, but that's my opinion, not only talk about strategies, but also about a substance. How, how does it work? How are the stereotypes of Jews, um, uh, of the Jew, because the Jew is the stereotype of the Jew, how does it function? How does it work? So, <laughs> please. I will, um, don't have too much to add. Uh, but uh, if social media is a subject here, not only popular tabloid media, etc., then there was a very successful uh, initiative here in Hungary. A group of uh, b people belonging to the so-called second generation founded a website uh, uh, with the title of the Holocaust in my family. Mm -hmm. And it was open for everybody and uh, a huge amount of people, several hundreds, put uh, small family histories uh, uh, on that side. This was open uh, for uh, uh, the public. And um, if I look at what happened, uh, uh, what has happened in the last couple of years, I think this was a, a breakthrough in a sense uh, in the memorization because it was not a conference, it was not a book, it was not a boring publication, uh, but something which appeared on uh, the screen of several hundreds uh, provoked emotions. Uh, they could react very directly, emotionally on that. Um, and uh, uh, well, I think this is something which could be, might be much more effective than um, any other uh, 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 mm -hmm. top-down uh, efforts. If, if, if I can just fill in also, um, I, I have uh, known from uh, Gwen Jones, she worked here for uh, some time in Budapest, there's this uh, Yellow Stars Houses project mm -hmm. uh, um, to show where uh, Jews have been living in Budapest, outside and later within the ghetto, and uh, there's also, that, that's so to say, 
uh, counter apps, so you can walk around there and see what has happened. The same happens is, is the case in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of, there's an open house, houses of uh, former Jewish inhabitants, but also of former Jewish resistance fighters. It's, it's, uh, so it's, it, it's, uh, well, it's in this sense, uh, uh, an alternative, alternative social media experiment because it's it's digital, um, and it's and it gives a lot of information on history and what has happened. Anything to add? Yes. Well, uh, I, I would like to first point out that I'm doing my part um, for social media by live tweeting this conference to raise awareness of. Uh, misuse of the Holocaust, but in addition to that, uh, I think academics ha and experts have a key role to play in connecting their research very concretely to recommendations and action items. Uh, so pairing with uh, advocacy organizations or organiz and governments I think can be uh, a very useful tool, but finally I'd also like to highlight just the importance of both education uh, and engagement of youth as well as building coalitions. So a lot of the work that we do around hate crimes, uh, training of civil society with a focus on youth about the broad range of stereotypes that happen. Uh, we tell them jokes and story, um, inappropriate uh, you know, racial jokes, uh, stories of, of bias, um, stories of stereotype, all of that uh, on the broad range of racism, xenophobia, uh, and anti-Semitism uh, issues to have a conversation about what it means to speak out, what it means to hear um, hear these stereotypes, um, you know, debunking stereotypes and, and giving them the courage to speak out on these issues um, so that the dialogue can change and, and in furthering education on these issues. Uh, and then I think the last thing also is just to continue to offer expertise, uh, working with the media. The media has never been easier actually to engage in certain ways because of social media. You can tweet directly at journalists. So uh, I think engaging with the media and helping them to develop best practices is, could be a critical area for, for academics as well. Absolutely, and I would also have consultancies, for instance, to movies and theater plays, and everything that deals with popular culture from this, result, from this regard. Uh, we know there were uh, films uh, that were more um, romanticized, like Schindler's List, but there were also film like, films like uh, Kenneth Branagh's uh, Conspiracy, which was more based on the real history than uh, romanticized. So there is indeed space for uh, consultancy by experts, even to this part of popular media. Any questions from the audience? Any comments from the audience? Great, so we are just on time. <laughs> uh, so we can invite the next panel. Please, yes, okay, yes. Okay, finally. <laughs> Since there weren't questions, I'll go ahead and ask this one. There's a form of popular media that is on the one hand encouraging to trained historians, but on the other hand discouraging, and that is the popularization of history. There are recent books such as that by uh, Timothy Snyder, his most recent publication being Black Earth, that have popularized this history in a way and have led to criticism that popular culture is sneaking into scholarship. Do the panelists have any co comments on this? And is it helpful or dangerous? Well, so we won't have time to get into a discussion about Snyder's book mm -hmm. now. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, uh, uh, the question is, uh, and that's uh, uh, a book uh, which uh, was had a, received strong criticism. Uh, 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 from all sides of Holocaust research, uh, uh, Professor Bauer can uh, uh, tell more about this. Uh, but the question is here whether statements appearing in such an academic publi publication, how, how these statements uh, will be re recontextualized popular media. And uh, uh, this is um, uh, naturally an important issue because it happens all the time and it happens the more uh, the more the publication is provocative. Uh, because if the publication is provocative yeah. enough, then the reactions will be, uh, uh, be, uh, uh, will appear, will be more uh, cri uh, 
critical or challenging or uh, even hostile. And uh, this is what, uh, I don't want to offend here the journalists, but this is what the journalists does understand usually. So here is something what we can fly on. Uh, and then they uh, will fly on it immediately. So this will be, I think this is the case with this book uh, uh, too. Uh, I would add that there is indeed a trend by the historians themselves to write historical novels instead of historical books. And that's also adding to the problem, indeed. Any other comment or question? Okay, thank you. Please, do you want to add something? Well, um, I think that also historians, uh, but, but, but I, I, I'm sure that, that, that Anders Kovas agrees, agrees they should take into their um, stories or academic stories not only uh, well social media it's 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 it's, it's so broad but but popular uh, opinion what lives among uh, what kind of ideas live among jews and uh, um, uh, uh, among the non-jewish population about jews and about the holocaust and i want you to give you one example which because it's very fresh uh, some, uh, a friend and, and of mine who works for many, many years at the Anne Frank Foundation. I'm sure you all know about mm -hmm. the Anne Frank Foundation. But in Amsterdam, the Amsterdam House, I should say, at Anne Frank House, where all those rows of people always are waiting. He still works there and then he, he was passed by an old study friend and from a long time ago, and this friend, old friend, old study colleague asked, are you still working for that Anne Frank um, house? And it was a cynical question. It was, it was like, uh, really, are you? And so uh, this uh, friend of mine, he, he, he gave a sarcastical answer too. He said, uh, yes, they're paying me very well. Why should I? Um, why should I um, uh, leave it? Like playing in on the stereotype of the the rich Jew, the Jew with the money. And then his his uh, the other person said, "Well, I I, I can't understand why you don't uh, think again. Uh, uh, what's the word? Why you don't think about leaving because." Of, uh, of Zionism, and this was the discussion. And so this, this very this com com complex of, uh, of um, criticism of Israel, anti-Zionism, and, and, and anti-Semitism, and also post-Holocaust anti-Semitism with this Jew, this very ambiguous st stereotype of the Jewish victim, I think, it, it, it should be analyzed and it should be countered uh, on, the, on the social media. Indeed. No more questions? Okay then, thank you. Thank you to the panelists and thank the uh, moderators for a very fruitful and illuminating morning.